Um, I'm really, really delighted uh, that you've all come along today. It's a great opportunity um, to hear all about The Roar Behind the Silence, the book. Um, a couple of things before we start to the emergency exits. Yes, one over there and one behind me. <laughs> uh, if you could just turn off your mobile phones and we are going to do some tweeting today. So we are um, hashtag UCD Middlefeet Masterclass, all lowercase. And we're going to, um, so feel free to tweet. Um, obviously, your own tweets are your own tweets. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, it's great to uh, get you all involved in that, and especially when Sina Byron. By I'm saying it right, Emma. <laughs> She's giving out to me earlier on. <laughs> Byron, yeah, I got it right. Okay, um, is here our our master tweeter. <laughs> Thank you for for. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Sue. And Sue is um, our first speaker tonight. Sue spent 15 years working as a midwife in various clinical research and project development roles. Um, and in January 2001, she joined the University of Central Lancashire in England, where she is now the Professor of Midwifery Studies. Her main research focus is the nature of and cultures around normal birth. As you know, she's the editor of Normal Birth Evidence and Debate and is the founder chair of the International Normal Birth Research conference series which is now in its 11th year and which has been um, held in UK, China, uh, Brazil and Australia. She's run, she runs the Innovative Normal Birth Evidence Debate Masters in Midwifery uh, module in 2010, from, from 2010 within University of Central Lancashire and she has supervised over 16 PhD students, one which I'm saying I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted to be a student of hers. Um, she is well, um, she, as well as running a number of local funded projects, she is a principal investigator of number of numerous um, investigations. One is which is a EU cost action. So this is she's actually currently on her second EU cost action. She's a PI of a major uh, projects that that are, that are going on, um, which the current one is over what 2.3 million more maybe. No, 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 no. no the first one was the first one was it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So. A uh, fabulous amount of work that she's um, been involved in and is continuing to be involved in. So we're absolutely delighted to have her here at UCD Midwifery. So we'll give a big round of applause to Sue. Those kind of issues of commercialism, hierarchy, patriarchy, um, uh, lack of lack of appreciation of women's physiology. She's flat on her back. So what chance has she got anyway? You know, quite apart from anything else. And actually, I don't. You probably wouldn't have heard it because it was quite difficult to hear. But they talk about the woman is it. So when they're looking for the patient, they say, when they find the patient, the woman, they say, bring it over here. So that notion of objectification of the woman as, a, you know, as an element in the, tech, in the technocratic system as opposed to a, an individual or a person. And the other thing I notice is that the, you know, knowing that the consequence of that is that she's going to get depressed, the solution is more, more, more drugs. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, you know, the, the system becomes self-perpetuating in, in, in a way. Okay, that was then, this is now. Now this is it's a clip that Sheena found and I'm using um, from Uruguay, so it's not from the UK or from um, Europe, but I still think it's worth looking at. I'm gonna have a bit, few more reflections back on this one as well, if we can get this one to go. Let's see. sound.
okay. It doesn't happen here though, does it? Sadly, although it might not happen in quite that, to quite that extent, for some women, the experience feels a bit like that. This is, this is a study that we did in the UK, um, near to, in, in the northwest of England, Jill Thompson's PhD study, that she published in a number of papers. And what she was looking at was women who had traumatic birth followed by positive birth. Sometimes, in one woman, it was the other way around. But generally speaking, they had a traumatic birth and then a positive one. And when she talked to them about the traumatic birth they'd had, it was actually not about mode of birth, although there are associations with mode of birth, but it was more about this, fractured interpersonal relationships. That was the most important thing. And so there were three themes, being disconnected, being helpless, and being isolated. That sense that you saw in both of those videos of, of women feeling like they were disconnected from humanity at a time when they should be most surrounded by love, really. The opposite of that. And the, the, the traumatic birth was characterised by these women as violent and abusive, torture, they use the word torture, profound sense of disassociation, annihilation. So the kinds of words that torture victims use is the words these, women's these women used. And you think, this, how can this be? And how can it be that they're going through this experience of childbirth and yet these kinds of things are happening? And it's not necessarily just about maternity, which we'll come back to later. But just, I'm just going to give you some quotes just to, just to read through. And this is what the woman said. And ag again, if you think about that last video I showed you and what this is saying, actually, it's not so different. And you can see this is not just cesarean births. You know, this is not just the classic, um, you know, we, we, we may want, I don't, know how, I don't know if everybody in here in, the room, in this room is a midwife or there's some obstetricians or others, but midwives, we do tend to characterise this as being something that's done by the doctors. But actually that's not what happened to these women necessarily. Elizabeth Smythe talks about this notion of violence of the everyday in healthcare, and it, she's, she's meaning it across the whole of healthcare, not just in maternity. And to an extent, we're all taught this, aren't we? I'm sure that everybody coming into maternity, when you first start, you, you are deeply emotionally um, bonded. I remember when the first woman, when I trained you, you in order to push, you had, to, you had the woman's legs up here, yeah, and she was lying flat on the back, well, more or less flat on the bed. And so she'd be pushing, and I was pushing with her, like, Ooh! You know, and by the end of a shift, I'd be absolutely knackered because I've been doing all this pushing with this woman because you're so, you so empathise with them at that early stage. But you have to learn not to. Well, do you? But, you know, we are taught not to or we learn not to to um, avoid emotional burnout. But actually, the, more, the further away you get from that empathic experience, the easier it is to have these things happen around you and not see them. So this research was done about six years ago, maybe. So it's not very current, but it's not, you know, it's pretty current and it's in the UK. And maybe really what we have to do is learn from our past on this. It's difficult for us to see our present because you're in the middle of it, you know, in the middle of what's happening. And it's very, very hard to take yourself out of that. Although I would actually suggest that it might be worth trying to find a day a year when you just, you just go to the place you work and watch. Have a day when you don't work, you just watch, just to see what it does look like from the outside. But anyway, trying to get beyond that. So if we think about where we were in the past, and I think this was also this was true in Ireland as much as in the UK, there was a big push around the 1940s, 14, you know, early part of the 20th century for twilight sleep to relieve labour pain, that people were actually very um, interested in this twilight sleep. And it was pushed by wealthy upper middle class women, the kinds of women that are currently... Uh, 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 arguing for things like routine epidurals, well not routine, but uh, you know, widely available epidurals and, and you know, cesarean on demand and all these kinds of things. Groups of women who have the power to try and make change happen, I suppose, and for the benefit of women, of other women and themselves. This is, all this is taken from Wikipedia, by the way. Wikipedia is a great source, I say, as a, as a professor. And this particular one, Mrs. Carmody, um, argued very strongly for twilight sleep to be available to all women and that you, know, you had to fight it because most doctors were opposed to it and it was very important that you did and there, were, there was research and the, the press kind of you know, highlighted it. Um, but, oops, it was very controversial because uh, it's a bit like the kind of date rape drug that's used. Women who had it, it was a mixture of scopolamine, scopolamine and something else, and the women who had it had complete amnesia. They didn't remember what, they, what, their, what their birth was like at all afterwards, but during birth, they were completely out of control. So they would be swearing, they'd be thrashing all over the place, they'd be behaving in ways they would never normally behave, which is why they ended up being, being this is a woman who's had twilight sleep, so completely um, 
having all external stimulus removed from them during the labour because they became so overexcited by the stimulus that they had it. Often they were strapped down. This is probably where the strapping down in the US maybe have, has come from. So it was very controversial amongst doctors. There was huge discrepancy in how it was used. And as I say, you had all these kind of um, effects, but women, women remembered nothing because they didn't remember the labour at all afterwards. And in fact, what happened, uh, it's interesting, when I've done this twice before, people have laughed when I've said that, when I've given you this next bit, which I do find intriguing. But anyway, see what your, see what your gut response is to this. So it, it, really was a very sh it was only used for a very short period of time, so 1914 to 1915, because of all these problems. And the Mrs. Comody, who was pushing for it, actually died under the influence of twilight sleep. And obviously, as a consequence of that, the whole thing went, fell out of favour. But the issue really is how far we learn from these kind of innovations that come sweeping in as the answer to everything. And then we, they become widely introduced. And we've got a number that are currently in our maternity services at the moment that are being widely introduced. Like I understand that you're having uh, perineal support being introduced certain pl places of the country. I think it was in the North of Ireland. Okay, in the North of Ireland, right. Which is not based on good randomised trial evidence. Um, even even the what is it called the fetal heart fetal measurement you know the fundal height measurement and then referral never been subject to a randomized trial those data so we're we're beginning we're doing things that seem like kind of they seem like obviously things to do that are good obviously it seems good but actually very often when we unpick these things they're not so obviously good so it was obviously good that you hospitalized women for birth obviously in the 1970s why wouldn't you and in fact now we know that isn't the best solution for women who are uh, are healthy who are women who are healthy who are happy to be out of hospital. It's not the best place for them to be in hospital. Episiotomy was obviously a good thing to do because obviously you want to protect the perineum, like why wouldn't you? And I don't know about here, but our episiotomy rate, I think, in, I mean, I, when I was training, all primary gravids had, a, had a, an episiotomy. And I think now probably, I don't know, was it 10% our episiotomy rate in the UK or something like that? I don't know what your rate is. Do you know what your rate is here in Ireland? Yeah. I'm guessing you don't do it routinely for... for which, how many? Six, yeah. With forceps, yeah, exactly, which is fair enough. But yeah, so, you know, again, we, we thought that was a great idea. We thought cesarean section was a great idea. It is a great idea for 10 to 15% of women who need it and babies who need it. It's not a great idea. Once you get it above 10 to 15%, we know from WHO data that you begin to get an increase in maternal mortality in healthy women who have cesarean sections when they don't need, when they don't need to. And the latest, the latest thing, happening in the UK, I'm not sure if it's happening here, is induction of labour going up like that. Our induction rate, I think, is going up by about 30% in, in many uh, parts of the, of the UK, again, as a consequence of both the growth, um, the GROW um, uh, intervention and also the AFFIRM study, which is actually a trial. I don't know if, are you doing AFFIRM here? No. That's one about where women come and report with, with reduced fetal movements, you act on it, which makes a lot of sense and it is being done as part of a randomised trial. But we are having this problem with this steep rise in induction. And we may say, OK, well, that's all right, because I mean, if you look, for example, at this is induction for post-maturity, some of these things are really good. So we know from the Cochrane Library that if you um, induce women who are post-mature, then you have less perinatal deaths. OK. You actually have to induce around about 410 women on average to reduce by one perineal, the perineal death. But it's actually, the range is from 322 to 1, 000, nearly 1,500. So at the top end, you have to induce around about 1,500 women who are post-mature to reduce by one uh, perinatal death. At the bottom end, around about 300. And that's fine, as long as there are no harms to the induction. So as long as you are not causing harm by doing the induction, again, who would argue with that? What the Cochrane Review has said is there are actually no difference in most outcomes if you induce women routinely who are post-mature in the randomised trial evidence. You actually have less meconium aspiration um, and you have counterintuitively for, intuitively for many, you have less cesareans if you induce, not more, less, if you induce women for post-maturity. So, uh, the other interesting thing in this is that when you do that induction, it doesn't really make much difference. So whether you do it at... Um, term plus three or term plus 15 doesn't actually seem to make that much difference in terms of these outcomes. They don't report on the numbers needed to harm. And, you know, from the data, it looks like maybe the numbers needed to harm is zero. So maybe this is an intervention that is a good thing that we should be paying some attention to. 
However, we are now only beginning now to find out what these other consequences might be for this, you know, for the benefit of, of reducing um, perinatal death by one, which is a, a good benefit. So, as I've just said, certainly in the UK, the, our scans are going up again by about 30 percent. The, the, the anecdotally, there's no strong, there's no formal evidence, but anecdotally, as you go around the country, they're saying that our use of ultrasound scan is going up by about 30 percent. Again, not a problem if there's no consequences to that. The problem is that there might be because nearly all the evidence around the safety of ultrasound is from 1992, when actually the acoustic energy was about an eighth of what it is now. So we haven't done any good evidence, any good uh, research, and we should be doing the research now on what happens when you have ultrasound scans being used at a much higher acoustic energy level and much more frequently. So women in, in the UK anyway, on average now, are getting about four scans in a pregnancy, whereas when the original research was done, it was one or maybe two. This is um, some unknowns about long-term equipment, and we don't know how, s how closely um, attention is paid to safety gauges. And again, people, I think th people think that ultrasound is benign because it's just a, a scanning device, but actually the way it works is by the sound waves, Doppler sound waves, agitating the maternal and fetal tissues. And if you do scan, you do tend to get a reaction from the baby, which again, you know, we, we know and we do know again from the early studies that women who had more than five scans had an increase in left-handedness, in left-handedness, that's right. There was, there was a higher level of left-handedness in babies that were scanned more than five times. Again, you know, handedness might not be a problem, but it suggests that something might be going on. Now, this particular, um, these statements are actually made in the New York, in the Wall Street Journal, which I think is extremely interesting because, you know, in the USA, generally speaking, there's very little query of the use of intervention during labour and birth. It's not something that people think is a problem. In fact, the reverse, you know, th there's a general assumption that actually the more you intervene, the better. So this is this year, I think, or maybe last year, and I think it's very recent. Um, so I do find it intriguing that in, the Amer in America they're beginning to get itchy about this. And I think there is a, we've just been, I've just been involved and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute, in the uh, WHO new antenatal care guidelines. And one of the things we looked at was what are the benefits of having, of scanning. And the conclusion is that one scan, an early dating scan or an abnormality screening scan, one or two, depending when you do it, is probably useful. But there's absolutely no evidence that beyond that, there is a benefit. And so we're not recommend that, uh, unless they change it between our discussions and when they come out in a few months' time, the WHO guidelines will not recommend more than, I, th I can't remember if we said two or one, but anyway, definitely no more than two scans early in pregnancy for these kinds of reasons, because we don't actually know what the consequences are. So Meanwhile, this is for healthy women, healthy women, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, there'll be reasons why you would do it for women who, who are at higher risk, yeah. Um, we know that in some countries, like in Vietnam, there's a concern that what is happening is that ultrasound is becoming antenatal care. So women are not having antenatal care, they're just having ultrasound scans. So that's another consequence of increasingly using scanning. And in one particular study, one of my PhD students who's doing some work, uh, she, she's an American doing a study in Germany, in German birth centres, which are very countercultural in Germany. Birth centres much more countercultural than here. But what she found is a lot of the women wanted all, this, all the interventions during pregnancy they could have, and then when they got to the birth centre in labour, they wanted nothing. They, you know, they were kind of shifting between these two things, which was really interesting. And anyway, one of them had 50 five zero scans in her pregnancy. She was an obstetrician, and every time she went into the unit, she'd just have a quick scan. Now, you know, what's the consequence? We don't know. The other thing that I think is interesting, and that it comes back a little bit to what we were saying before, is this, this, the, the solution, well, you know, we, we decide that we, don't, we shouldn't do something. So, okay, we shouldn't do twilight sleep, so we'll bring in some new, we'll bring in pathogen. We shouldn't do, um, we shouldn't do a episiotomy. Actually, we didn't bring much in against episiotomy, as it happens, but we shouldn't do, you know, generally speaking, you don't replace an intervention unless you've got another intervention to replace it with. It's very difficult to replace an intervention with nothing, to not do something, yeah? So what's now happening is the, there's a strong move towards using induction of labour as birth or physiological birth. We're saying, oh, great, great idea. Let's just do more induction of labour. And again, as I said to you before, you know, if you, if you look at the Cochrane Review on induction of labour, I don't know if you can all read these diagrams, but this little, di this little diamond, if it's this side, benefit is, it favours induction. And this is the particular <coughs> one that you're looking at here is, is the use of caesarean. So it's definitely on the side of favouring the induction of labour for... Um, for reducing caesarean. And again, you may say, okay, that's 
we don't, I mean, okay, induction may or may not have some problems associated with it. We know cesarean definitely has problems associated with it if it's overused. So this is a good thing. Let's do more inductions. There was an interesting review that was published a couple of years ago in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, interestingly. And they did a systematic review of all the trials, um, including the ones that were in the Cochrane and the ones that were in women who had intact membranes uh, around induction of labour. And they found the same as everybody else has found, which is that basically um, reduction in the risk of caesarean. They found the same thing. But they went on to sub-analyse those data. And what they, f what they found out, if we go back to that Cochrane diagram again, uh, those of you who don't understand these things, the smaller the line, the, the closer the line is together, the bigger the study. And the bigger the box, the more important the study. So you can see that this one study, the HANA trial, is heavily overweighting all the other studies in this trial, in, the, in this systematic review. So these particular reviewers, remember they're obstetricians writing in a obstetric journal, which, you know, as I say, is intriguing, really. Didn't leave it, at, leave it at that. They actually looked into what was actually making that effect, because they were also intrigued by the effect. They thought, well, this doesn't make much sense from what we observe in practice. And what they found is when, you, when they unpacked the HANA trial, the group that were supposed to be expectant management, a third of them were actually induced. But only 9% of the ones that were induced actually got, pr got um, prostaglandins for cervical ripening. Whereas half of the ones in the immediate induction group got prostaglandins for cervical ripening. So what they are saying is actually it's possible that the women who were al allegedly in the expectant group were actually not only induced, but also not induced in the same way as the women in the, in the immediate induction group. And what they actually conclude, this is their words, that they felt that the expectantly managed group, because they were later in their gestations, made people more worried. And because they were more worried, they jumped in quicker once the women came in in labour or once they'd induced them. Does that make sense? So because they were not under the control of the system, looking back at those videos we saw before, then the, um, the resort to a caesarean was undertaken sooner. This is what some obstetricians are saying, not me. The review, they say, again, their words, may reflect doctor's discomfort with delayed delivery in high-risk women. So this was a mixed, actually, this was a mixed population. Some were high, some were low. That once they're in labour, manifests as more frequent caesarean sections. So that's an interesting thing. And then actually this is, this is some data from very recent, as you can see, 2016. This is from uh, one of the large population databases that exist in, in, in Scandinavia. They have these fantastic databases that track everybody and they've got loads of data. So Sweden, um, up in, uh, between those years, you can see there. So over a million women they looked at. So a whole population of women between 37 weeks and, and 41 plus 6. Induction increased, went up. So it went up from 7.7 .7 to 12.9 and actually about the same in multips as primates. When they sub-analysed these by women who had no particular recognised medical complication, women who were induced because they were fed up with the pregnancy or they were a little bit late or whatever, big differences in caesarean, big increases in caesarean. So a three times increased risk of caesarean for women who were induced between 39 and 41 weeks with no particular medical reason and a 40% increase uh, risk of caesarean in those who were induced earlier, 37 to 38 weeks. So this raises the question about what is going on here. If, why is it that in trials we're finding this reduction in caesarean, but in real life practice we're not? Something else is going on here. And this is just a, this is a, this is a, you know, an issue that I think is co quite a complicated quote from a fairly old study, which is finding something similar. But what this is saying is that if you induce women, then the labour goes slower than it would if you were in spontaneous labour. So you can leave them in longer in um, active labour arrest before you intervene. So they're basically saying, if you've got women in spontaneous labour who's labouring for about the same as a woman in, who's induced, you, can intervene, you should intervene quicker in the woman in spontaneous labour because we know that induction goes slower. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it doesn't make sense, but does it make sense? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you know, what we're, we're kind of... What I'm trying to do here is reflect back on why those videos look like they do, why we're, why we're doing the things we're doing. And the other thing is to reflect back on what the consequences, or reflect on what the consequences might be. Because remember I was talking about numbers needed to harm and how it looks like it was zero if you looked at the Cochrane data. I have to say, I do Cochrane reviews. I've got nothing against Cochrane. But I think this is the, this is the unpacking of this data, really, to see what's underneath it. So this is another uh, big Swedish database. This is um, looking back at, this is a retrospective study, which is not as good as a prospective one. 
looking back at babies who um, where labor spot started spontaneously and they were born spontaneously, but some of them were augmented. So they were looking at the use of oxytocin in this case for augmentation in otherwise healthy women and babies, uh, where the labor was long but not pathological, just long. And they found that there was an increase, uh, twice as, as high um, risk of a low APGAR score in the women that, in the babies that had the oxytocin, almost a doubling rate of uneven neonatal intensive care and a four times greater rate of operative birth. So again, this is about not, not using interventions, but targeting them appropriately. So we're not causing harm to healthy mothers and babies. And this is a, you know, another one, another kind of straw in the wind, really. So this is a study, in fact, of, of horses that were induced. I have no idea why they were induced. God knows. But they were induced. And they followed the foals up to 10 days postnatal. And they found that there was actually an effect in terms of the endocrine system. So that the baby, the, the babies, the foals, the foals that had been induced had a much higher rate of cortisol level in their blood at 10 days postnatal. This is not immediately after the birth. Mm -hmm. And this actually had an impact on various um, metabolic functions around glucose and insulin. And their conclusion was that induced delivery leads to changes in pancreatic beta cell sensitivity and it has an effect on tissue insulin resistance. Now, <coughs> that's relevant because we know, this is now in terms of caesarean, not induction, but still that, you know, it, the question is around what happens during labor and birth. We know that there is a, a link in a number of studies between what happens during birth and non-communicable disease, autoimmune disease. So there's a 20% increase in a number of studies in type 1 diabetes in the neonate following caesarean. Now I have to say, please, you know, please don't get, the, rate, the risk of type 1 diabetes is extremely low. So we're talking about 20% on an extremely low baseline. You know, we're not saying 20% are going to have diabetes, but linked with diabetes, eczema, asthma, multiple sclerosis, bronchiolitis, this one, I've just, this has just come out. This is, this is oxytocin. These are all cesarean links. This is an oxytocin link just come out. It's a strong study. And so on. And we also know, because we've been doing some work on epi the epigenome, that there are changes in white blood cell DNA methylation in core blood, again, after cesarean. Less work's been done with induction. So we don't know yet with induction because we haven't looked at it. But this is definitely um, evident following cesarean. Again, this is all still... Um, if you like, in terms of science, there's still hypothesis, even though we're seeing these data, we don't know what the cause to effect might be. So it might be antibiotic use in labor, intracesarean, it might be to do with drugs, it might be to do with predisposing factors. It could be that all of these, um, women who experience all of these things have previous predisposing factors. But most of these studies have controlled for those. So most of them can have controlled for family history of diabetes, family history of autoimmune disease, Mother's Maybe sesame living, you might be less likely to breastfeed afterwards. Might be, yeah, yeah, could be associated with that. So we don't know, yeah, exactly. So this is, we can't say it's cause and effect. We can just say there's an association, absolutely. So, but the, there is an association. So that's the important thing, that something is going on here. And maybe this comes back to a conversation we were having earlier on in the meeting we had. We, talk, we spend all this time talking about not doing cesareans and maybe not doing induction or maybe doing induction. But actually what we don't talk about <coughs> is labour being potentially good for us. But it's possible and probably actually likely, given that we've evolved this way for like forever, over a millennia, that what happens during labour and birth does good things to women and babies, if it's physiological. Healthy women, I'm always talking about healthy women and babies. You know, don't get me wrong, caesareans are great when they're needed, induction is great when it's needed. That's not the issue here. The issue is what we're doing to healthy women and babies in the name of for example, reducing perinatal mortality by one in one and a half thousand, or whatever the figure might be. And again, in the end, at the end of the day, this is an ethical, an ethical dilemma. You know, it, it may be that we all think it's fine that we actually expose one and a half thousand women and babies, or maybe as small as 300 women and babies, to what we don't yet know, but look like there might be some consequences, but we still save one baby. That might be okay, and I'm not making an argument about that. And what I'm saying is, we can't say that it's benign, that it's totally benign. It's not. The numbers needed to harm does not equal naught, effectively. <laughs> this is quite a complicated diagram, and I've just actually picked it up yesterday because uh, I'm moving into the human rights thing here. So there's a Euro, Euro Health Consumer Index human rights kind of thing, and countries are ranked from 1 to 37 on this, on this um, graph, this ratio, which is basically looking at patients' rights in health, accessibility waiting times, the services available, 
prevention of disease and access to pharmaceuticals. And so this is the ranking of the countries from top to bottom. And then somebody on this particular email that was sent out also wrote down the cesarean section rates by country to the nearest 5%. So these aren't, these aren't you know, I know you're, you're right, I've got your rate down as 25, I think, and I think it's 26 or 27, yeah, maybe a bit higher. Yeah, yeah, I think these are a couple, this is probably 2010 data, actually, because it comes from Peristat, from the European thing. And what I've done is the countries with the highest rates are in red, um, green is the median rates, and blue is the lowest rates. And, you know, again, cause and effect, you can't talk about cause and effect necessarily, but it is interesting, I think, that the countries that are, better rank better on this kind of human rights index for health if you like tend to have lower rates they're all you know switzerland's got a really high rate so it's not it's not necessarily a you know a clear association but there's more blue in these 20 countries that are at the better end of the human rights bit and more red in these countries that are the other end of the human rights bit but also these are higher higher socioeconomic yeah so it may be this is maybe something else but the point again here is there's not a correlation between high rates of cesarean and high rates of good health care. That, that's the point, one way or the other. So this matters because it's a human rights issue. So in Greece, Greece has been called to account by CEDAW, which is a, UN, a UN convention for discrimination against women. And I'll let you read this. Uh, concerned... So CEDAW is actually seeing the high rates of cesarean as a human rights issue, as a gender human rights issue. And, and they've actually urged Greece to do something about it because they're saying this is, this is violence against women, going back to what we were saying before, and babies, potentially, because we know that cesarean isn't always good for babies either. <coughs> and you may or may not have seen this. This is, this is the first publication, really, that properly um, surfaced this notion of disrespect and abuse. There's been talk about obstetric violence for a while, and I use the word obstetric violence advisedly because it's not just obstetricians. In fact, in the country where obstetric violence was invented, the word for midwife is obstetrare, and the word for doctor is gynaecologist. So in that country, obstetrics doesn't mean it's obstetrician, actually. So the, this came out of Latin America, Uruguay, and actually came out of Chile, I think, originally, or Peru. But anyway, um, these people who are from Harvard in the, UK, pick, in the, U, in the USA picked it up and they looked at, they, they, look, they did a systematic review of accounts in the literature of di what they call disrespect and abuse around the world. And they plotted these various aspects of disrespect and abuse for the first time. And that's been picked up subsequently. Um, we published a paper a few years ago in one of the leading medical journals saying, showing that one of the reasons that women in low-income countries don't use antenatal care is because of the way they're treated when they do use antenatal care. So there's a, there's a link between maternal mortality and the way women are treated. You know, it's not just about clinical care, it's about the way they're treated, because in these countries where they live miles away from a hospital and it's, they have to, you know, literally brave wild animals to get to the hospital, what, and it takes them days, and if they're not in, working in the fields, they lose, they lose food, they lose their kind of well-being, their income, and they get to the hospital and they're treated badly, why are they going to go back? Why would they bother? So... WHO has also engaged with this agenda. This is a recent paper from WHO about disrespect and abuse and childhood, uh, the way women are treated. It's a huge agenda now in, in the world. You know, and this is the White Ribbon Alliance who used to campaign for reducing maternal mortality, still do, but now they say this is one of the key things that we need to get right for, uh, to, to make sure that we don't actually, um, that we can reduce maternal mortality more because only if we treat women well within a well-functioning health system are we going to get the optimum maternal and, and in fact, infant mortality rates? So doing the right, wrong thing for the right reasons. And I think the important thing here is that we're not doing this stuff out of, you know, out of uh, because we're evil or bad or whatever. What do, this is a WHO, an old WHO publication, which is still very important and very useful, which basically talks about women being low risk at the start of labour, but says, and again, I'll let you read this, Sorry, should I read it? Okay, so they say the uncritical adoption of a range of unhelpful, untimely, inappropriate and or unnecessary interventions, all too frequently poorly evaluated, is a risk run by many who try to improve the maternity services. This is a really interesting message packed in here. So first of all, it's saying we're doing this because we're trying to improve things. But actually, because we're doing it at the wrong time, we're not doing it to the right people, it's unnecessary and we're not evaluating it properly, we are creating risk. We're not 
reducing it, we're creating risk. So, you know, it's an, and given that they're saying 70 to 80% of women are, are uh, low risk across the world, and that includes countries with endemic malaria, for example, you know, or women having 10 babies, our rate should be even higher than that. And I bet most of our risk scoring systems probably don't end up with more than 50%, probably. Well, that can't be right physiologically. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive as a human race. And of course, the consequence is this for many of us and many of our obstetric colleagues, actually. I mean, in the UK, there are, there are obstetricians who are grief struck because they can't do breech births, for example. You know, and they're, they're, it's, not that, it's not that they're happy with what's going on either. You know, a lot of us are stuck in this space. OK, so I'm moving into the positive bit of my bit, and I will segue into Sheena. It's, we can't keep doing what we're doing. We can't keep replacing one intervention with the next the whole time. We have to completely turn this whole thing on its head. So this is also Jill's work that I showed you before. But this is from the positive births. The same women who talked about torture and, and in fact they use words where it's like rape and torture and horror and all that kind of stuff. When they were asked about their positive birth, they used these words, joy, euphoria, fantastic, positive, amazing, in love, incredible. Polar opposites. Now we measure satisfaction, satisfaction. You know, actually, in most studies in any area of healthcare, about 80% of the people when asked say they're satisfied. Well, no matter what's happened, it's about 80%. Satisfaction is a rubbish, a rubbish measure for maternity care. In a, in, you know, I know you have birth centres here and where you're doing really good maternity care. This is what you should be measuring. And then you'll find out what's actually going on in terms of well-being. We're working on the basis of fight and flight the whole time at the moment. Fear, litigation, et cetera, et cetera. There is an alternative which is the 10 befriend model, which is you know, well known in psycho psycho psychological circles. And the 10 befriend model is about nurturing activities to promote safety, yeah, but also reduce distress. So it's not just about promoting safety. And the creation of social networks that might make a difference. And also it's about framing. So the, the question is not... not if we do this intervention to everybody, will we have a reduction in, in for a few? It's actually who do we do this intervention for? Who does it matter that we do this for? And who do we not do it for? So those who have actual need rather than those who have potential need. For the potential need, we're really working on the basis of everybody's either ill or not yet ill. <laughs> you know, you're going to be ill, so you might as well just get used to it. Really. Um, which context? So are we doing it in a context of a technocratic surveillance maternity services, like the, the videos I showed you? Or are we doing it in the context of, a, of care rooted in the midwifery philosophy? They're very different things. What works? What do we know works? Well, you know, I think we really have to grab hold of this as midwives and as, as obstetricians and as women. There's all this huge amount of money spent on doing all kinds of technical pharmacological interventions. But actually, what we know works is relationships. Midwife-led continuity of care is the only intervention ever shown to reduce prematurity by a, mass, by a large amount. We, we, know we're, we, we, we spend billions around the world on trying to find a drug to reduce prematurity. This works. Why are we not prescribing it for every woman? I mean, not only those women who are healthy, but those, not necessarily midwife-led, but certainly midwife continuity in collaboration with obstetricians for those who are... Um, at risk, and in fact, actually, in this particular review, it wasn't just women who were, who were low risk who were included in that review. We know continuous support during childbirth works to increase spontaneous labour and birth. Actually, so does this increase spontaneous labour and birth. It doesn't, rec doesn't reduce cesarean, but it increases spontaneous birth. Out-of-hospital birth, we know for sure, um, makes a difference in terms of all kinds of things. And is, is no more risky... It, it's more beneficial for the mother, it's no more risky for the baby, unless you're a primal gravid having a home birth, which is slightly more risky for the baby, but safer for the mother. And this, we need to learn from low-income countries, because this is a phenomenal intervention. This was a, a series of cluster randomised trials, big studies, done in a whole range of low-income countries, uh, in Africa and in Asia. And the, the intervention was just to get women together in women's groups, that's all they did. They got women together in villages, in women's groups, with a facilitator talking to each other in pregnancy. And what they found across all these trials, and the, the direction of effect was the same in all the trials, seven trials, same result, Bangladesh, Malawi, Nepal, goodness knows where. More than a third less women died. Again, there's no drug or treatment that's had this effect, the same effect. A fifth less babies, 23% less babies died. 
There was also a reduction in stillbirth that wasn't actually statistically significant. And what the authors conclude is if you've got at least 30% of local wind together doing this in only four, 74 countries, you could, you could save the lives of 283,000 neonates and 41,000 mothers every year. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it here? You know, why aren't we doing it all over the world? Relationships, very important. And we, in terms of the Lancet series on midwifery, um, this is one of the things that we, we took hold of, and, we, and Tina's going to tell you a bit about the definition of midwifery that we use there, but the definition was not necessarily what midwives do, it was what women and babies want and need. Sometimes midwives do it, sometimes obstetricians do it, sometimes others do it. And some of the main components are continuity and optimising physiological processes for everybody as far as possible, whether, they, whether they're healthy or with complications. And we tried not to use the word risk in the whole series. You hopefully won't find the word risk in there. We talked about healthy women and those with complications. And the antenatal guidelines I've told you about, but the important thing about these guidelines is for the first time, they asked the question, what do women want and need again? And we were lucky enough to be asked to do the, do the work on that, the review. So we did a systematic review on qualitative data of what women want in pregnancy, not what they experienced in antenatal care, what they wanted in pregnancy. And what they wanted, they valued a positive pregnancy experience, which was maintaining normality as far as possible, maintaining a healthy pregnancy, including treatments where they were needed, diagnosis and treatments where they were needed, effective transition to positive labour and birth, and achieving positive motherhood and maternal esteem and autonomy. The point being here that as an outcome measure, which is the, the outcome measure now being used in the review, women don't just want this. And this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow is a, a psychologist who talks about human fulfilment. And we are at the moment, I think, focusing down here, physiological needs and safety. That's it, that's where we're stuck, yeah? But in fact, as you saw from those quotes from the women having the positive births, actually, this is what childbirth should be doing. We should be doing all the rest of this, and we can, you know, if we get childbirth right. So belongingness and love, esteem and self-actualisation. And this is, what, this is what women are asking for. This is what came out of the, of the review. Um, oops. And the kinds of things that women wanted, which is what is forming part of the antenatal care guidelines now, um, to get that was support, the kind of thing in those relational studies I showed you about women's groups and midwife-led care, all across the board. Information, relevant and timely, not just a whole stack of leaflets, you know, here you are, you know, but proper information, properly given at the right time in the right place. And they did want, obviously, clinical care, but, you know, that was a small part of what, they kind of took that for granted. What they really wanted as well was this lot. So both and, not either or, was really what was being asked for. And that was published, in, again, in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. So for the first time, this notion of qualitative data and positive experience is beginning to turn up in the medical literature which is and we're not the only ones doing it there's a whole range of, of people now beginning to talk about this in the medical literature which makes it a bit more credible than it was before okay so basically how do we this is the very last bit of mine um how do we get there turning the silence into a roar oops positive deviance the eu has just put a paper out very recently called about what they call disruptive innovations <coughs> in healthcare across the board, you know, so cardiac disease as well as, they don't mention maternity actually, but you know, across the board. And what they're saying is we need to fundamentally change the way we do things, because the way we're doing things isn't working. And they're, prior, they're, they're encouraging researchers and others to engage in disruptive innovations, whole systems change. Easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than think your way into a new way of acting. This idea of just do it, just do it. Don't overthink it, just do it, that's gonna work. And what we, what we found as a consequence of the book, which really is Sheena's brainchild, I, have to say, I just kind of went along and tagged along on the coattails of Sheena for this. <laughs> but, you know, spontaneously, people have picked up the book, which has got lots of hints and tips and, you know, simple things to do, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been sending, Sheena mainly, these, these pictures of what they've been doing with it. So, you know, this is a New Zealand group. This is not so much raw, but just to tell you about her, this is Joanna Stan Stancheva who is a Bulgarian midwife who is trying to change the system in Bulgaria, which is completely, it's like the Uruguayan, Uruguayan, one, Uruguayan one I just showed you, and she's doing some amazing things as a newly qualified midwife. And she's supported by Sandra Morano, who's an Italian obstetrician. So obstetricians and midwives in different countries joining up and saying enough already and changing the system. Um, this is, is that the New Zealand one again? It might be. This is, but this is the Fernandez Hospital in India. They asked you for what, 50 books? Gina, yeah. Fernandez? Yeah. So this is one of the few hospitals in India where they train midwives. And um, it's a very, good, a very good hospital. 
very interesting hospital, and they've asked for 50 copies of RAW because they want to use them in India to change what's going on there. And I think for us, I mean, I know this isn't relevant to you, the maternity <coughs> re review, but you have your own new documents that are coming out in, in Ireland that you can seize the moment on and do something with because we're not going to get these chances again in a hurry. You know, we need to really do something with these new documents that are coming out, which for you, give you the opportunity to have midwife-led care for women with normal risk, whatever normal risk is, but there you go. But you know, a chunk of women anyway. And I think it's really important that you seize that moment. So I've just got a couple of quotes to end with, really. And I think Sheena's going to re-emphasise this. This is not a luxury. That relationship-based care is the most powerful thing, to do the thing that we say we're doing, which is making a safe maternity service for mothers and babies. You know, we, we may worry, we may not want to make change happen because actually if we make change happen, it suggests we did it wrong before. But, you know, she and I both remember when we used to lay babies on their stomach. And probably there were babies that may have suffered as a consequence of that. We did it for years. And we had to accept that we were doing a bad thing when we found the evidence was that we should do the opposite, lay them on their back. And I think you know, we have to face up to the fact that we've done it in some ways. There are things we've done wrong for a long time. Some things we've done very right, obviously. But it's our responsibility to make that shift happen and not be defensive about what we did in the past. So, really, this is just a challenge for you all before we segue into Sheena. <laughs> what will you do? What will you do in the next month in your own practice? One thing in your own practice in the next month. And Sheena will give you some tips. What will you do in the next three months with your peers and in the next six months with your organisation? And if every one of you, or if only actually ten of you, did that, you'll see the ripples throughout. And that's me. Sheena was one of the UK's first consultant midwives and as a head of midwife, she successfully helped to lead the development of three birth centres in East Lancashire. Sheena is a board member of the Royal College of Midwives and a member of the Royal College of Midwives Better Births Initiative, patron of studentmidwives.net and a chair of the Alanthea uh, Midwifery Trust. Sheena recently worked as a midwifery expert at the North uh, Cumbria University Hospital um, Trust, helping them to develop midwifery-led units. And she's one of the project leads for an exciting development called the Midwifery Unit Network. And we'll hear a little bit about, uh, more about that later. Sheena's um, midwifery uh, memoirs, uh, Catching Babies, I really recommend it, is a Sunday Times bestseller. And her absolute passion is promoting normal physiological birth and the positive childbirth experience for all women. And her latest book, as we know, we're here tonight uh, in relation to the roar behind the silence, why kindness, compassion, respect matter, um, the maternity care. And we have it here and it's on sale later on and will be signed by um, our authors. And also Deirdre Munro is one of our, our authors of the chapter as well, which we're very delighted to have with us. Um, and it'll be 10 euros later on, just to, that's uh, eight euros, okay. Uh, eight euros later on, yeah. Yeah, I've got refunds. <laughs> very good, we've got confirmation of a much. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to um, Sheena. So thank you, Sheena, for coming Just along. Before I sort of say hello properly, I'm going to um, take you to my first slide because it um, is about midwives and families. Is there anybody here tonight who isn't a midwife? Okay. <laughs> no, that's great because you're obviously here because you're interested in maternity services, so it's fabulous that you're here. Um, but the reason why I kind of want to show you this especially is because this is a photograph of my dad. This is Seamus. So my dad was Irish. And that's why I'm really overjoyed to be here. It's not just because I love being with midwives and, and I'm passionate about the work that um, Sue and I have been doing around the Raw Behind the Silence, but it's because it's Ireland. And I always feel like I'm quite near to him and, and his family, even though he doesn't have any family left in Ireland. But that's me sat on his knee on Blackpool Sands. He came when he was 19. Um, over to England so here yeah, this is this is I love the fact that I can show his picture so um, thank you again for inviting me here and I just want to start off by saying that um, sometimes when we work in maternity services we we see silent women we see sadness we see desperation and it's not always about uh, that it's not always around the women that we we serving it can be us that's, that that we're sad that we feel down that we've got particular stresses around what's going on in our lives it might be about the work that we're doing but it might be about our home life and we can never separate the two and sometimes it's you know we, we're silent uh, because we we have to be silent 
but sometimes it's very damaging if we're silent because we can't, we're not allowed to say something. And something's happening to me at the moment where I'm not allowed to say something that's very wrong, that's happening to me. And, uh, and that can be the most damaging thing. So we always have to be mindful that behind everybody's face, there can be these sadnesses of silence that's going on. Sorry, Sue. That, yeah, so we, we all, you know, I think particularly in maternity care, that's always should be held um, close to our hearts. And this is a photograph that I absolutely love. It's um, a photograph that was from, to, uh, my friend took it and has given me permission to use it. And I think it, epitomizes, sorry I've got a really bad cough and cold, it epitomizes um, what we want as midwives and maternity care workers. We want to see a mum that falls in love with her baby when it's born, however that baby's been born, whatever circumstances, that she feels totally overjoyed, like Sue says, falls in love with the baby. And I reckon that most of us in this room come to work because of that. But actually, we don't always see that, do we? And we've heard tonight from Sue, we don't see it. And what, why is it that we, we, we come across women who feel totally traumatized by their birth experience? This is a photograph of me in the 1970s, and I met a midwife today. What was she called, the midwife, the, the director of midwifery from the hospital that was at the meeting today? What was Margaret, who's left, yeah. So Margaret's the same age as me, we found out, month between us. So we trained at the same time. I did a year's training in England. And, um, and like Sue, I did things that I'm really ashamed of. So I separated mums and babies. I gave bottle, breastfed babies um, bottle milk in the middle of the night because I was told to. I shaved women without even asking them. I gave them two pints of the best um, in their rectums and never asked them if it was okay. I just did it. And I, was, I thought I was a really kind midwife. And I, I, I would imagine that, that women, I would like to think anyway, that women that I cared for would have felt that I was kind and, comp and compassionate. And the reason why I'm telling you about these things um, is because when I tell student midwives that I separated mums and babies, and when I tell them that I actually um, uh, had to bind women's breasts up because they were s in so much pain, um, and the women were asleep with sleeping tablets. The babies were crying in the nursery and we used to give them bottle milk. Then the mums were crying in the morning because their breasts were so engorged on day three because they stayed in that long. Um, then, I, I, and it, I was just taught to do that, you know, nappy pins, straight, you know, that was a skill that I had to learn. What I'd like to pr propose to you, especially if the student midwives in the room, or younger midwives that have got a long way to go before they retire, what I'd like to propose to you is what do you think that you'll be talking about in 30 years' time if you're stood here? And you might be thinking, oh my God, I'll never be stood there. Well, I never imagined that I'd be stood here tonight um, talking to you like this because I'm literally an ordinary girl from an ordinary town in England and I didn't <coughs> imagine that this would be happening. So I'd like you to challenge yourself and think, what is it that I'm going to change and I hope that one of those things is that you don't see women's legs in stirrups in 30 years' time, because it is the most diabolical act that we could have. So I know that from my day, things have changed. Some things for the better, of course, but some things for the worse. And I know going around the country, uh, going around the United Kingdom, and certainly to hearing from different midwives around Europe, and this morning I heard from a midwife in Australia, that they're feeling totally pressured by their job. They're, um, they're, you know, I've just recently written a blog that's had 30 comments on it, and you know, quite quickly, because uh, uh, midwives are resonating with that, that t feeling of complete pressure. They don't know how to cope anymore. And what do we do about that? You know, how do we, how do we kind of overcome that and nurture midwives and help midwives to you know, to carry on doing the job that they feel totally passionate about. And we have, mid we have a, you know, an issue here on the micro level where we, we have to try to find ways of nurturing young midwives to help them to continue to provide woman-centred care. But we also have to change things at a macro level, which I know Sue's been talking about. And we're always debating, what can we do about it? How can we get politicians involved, governments involved? How can we get commissioners involved? And, 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 and lawyers and journalists, because certainly in the United Kingdom at the moment, journalists seem to be overtaking. I know in Ireland you, you've got the same issue. They're kind of coming out with all these horrendous statements about maternity services. They aren't doing anybody any good. 
you know. So uh, particularly the midwives working on the shop floor. So what's happening? We've got, we know we've got these excessive amounts of guidance and I worked in a day when we didn't have guidelines. I was absolutely overjoyed when we started to develop guidelines um, because I, when I worked we had you know, five different consultants that wanted different things and they would, the women belonged to the consultant and we had to do what they wanted. So when clinical guidelines came in it was actually a relief that we could do things based on what evidence there was and, and it wasn't down to do individual preference. Um, but what's happened now is that guidelines and protocols and policies have completely lo like overburdened us and we're becoming restricted in our practice and we're also being audited constantly. And you know, we hear, um, we, you know, I'm a total believer in, in good compre uh, 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 cohesive uh, record keeping. It, it's imperative that we record keep appropriately. But now we're doing excessive record keeping. We're writing everything down three times, four times. So much so that midwives are telling us that they feel more record centered than woman centered, that the records become the most important thing that they have to concentrate on because they're worried about getting into trouble if it's not written down. And what I always challenge individuals by saying, so does that mean if you've written it down, you've done it? Because I know midwives who've said they're so scared of their records being audited and they haven't written something down and they can't do certain things like, for example, um, on the antenatal ward when women are labouring on the antenatal ward and there isn't room for them on the delivery suite to the labour ward. And so they're having, and, and the guidelines in, in uh, the United Kingdom say that they've got to listen to the fetal heart when a woman's in first stage of labour, you know, sort of every 15 minutes. They can't do that. It's physically impossible. So they write down that they have done it. That's what crosses their mind. The woman won't know. I'm just going to write down that I've done it. Well, how dangerous is that? So the very things that are trying to protect us are actually potentially causing us harm. So we have to try to do something about that at a macro level. We also know, and I'm not going to go into it, that we've got interventions in, in, in labour that are, are, are irrelevant. And Sue has talked to you, so I won't go into it, but this is, a, this is Sue Down and the Royal College of Midwives have just produced this. They're available freely on the RCM website if you want to get it. So if you just Google on, on the uh, RCM, Royal College of Midwives, Sue Down, the University of Central Lancashire, and you'll be able to see this document, um, and I haven't got time to go into it. Um, today and every day, there isn't a day goes by when I'm talking about maternity services, and it was a very reason that we wanted to edit this book. It's not really, it's not our book. It belongs to 35 other people, um, but we. We, um, we, we talked about this non-stop, and I still do every day, that fear is running through the veins of maternity services. And again, I could do two hours talking about this, but I'm not going to do because I'd, I'd just like to recommend that you read the work of um, Hannah Darlin. She's a professor of midwifery in Australia, in Sydney. And, um, and she's, done, she's written extensively about fear, but the way she writes about it is so accessible to us as midwives and doctors and doulas and maternity workers because what she explains is that, you know, whilst we're running around um, being fearful and doing things because we're scared and we're trying to protect ourselves, where the woman almost becomes the enemy because all we want to do is protect ourselves from being sued or getting into trouble, so we almost come go at loggerheads with a woman, potentially. She says that, that we're manufacturing fear and it's strangling us. Um, so we're doing things because we're thinking that there's a problem when there isn't. And so we have to distinguish between fear that actually protects us and helps us to deliver safe care and fear that actually leads us into practice that is uh, defensive practice and we're potentially harming women and harming ourselves because it doesn't do us any good when we're working in that way. And this is an example of fear. A midwife from Ireland contacted me recently and said, you know, we've just, a, 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 a woman who'd had a baby um, in our trust actually baked some cakes for, um, for us and she actually worked for a hypnobirthing company but her and a little boy came in with these cakes to give to the midwives on the International Day of the Midwife and they're shaped like boobs you can see, little nipples 
and uh, the midwives were overjoyed but they got confiscated so the midwives didn't get the cakes they were confiscated she didn't really know the reason why but she thinks it was because of safety health and safety because of infection control or whatever um, and I know that that goes on and I'm not saying this is what I'm, I'm highlighting it because this is a symptom of fear because first of all the midwife one of the midwives that I spoke to didn't want to ask why because she was too scared and secondly I reckon the people who confiscated and were also fearful of doing the wrong thing too I've worked as a head of midwifery I've worked at a high level in a very very busy consultant unit and I was scared I was fearful and sometimes I could feel myself turning I could feel myself becoming the midwife that I didn't want to be because I was absolutely scared stiff so I'm not saying that this isn't real or right or I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying that I know that fear. I have felt it. But since I begin it, began to read about it and learn about it, I've been able to help myself not to be as fearful. Um, so again, and after Elizabeth Prochaska, the lawyer, Elizabeth came here to Ireland and, and did a talk um, of several months ago. And this was a report in the Irish Times that she would be scared to be a woman, you know, in re of reproductive age in Ireland. And I know that there's many of you in the room will know that and feel that too. But isn't that sad that that's been said about your country? And why is it? And I know you've got the Eighth Amendment and I know that there are things happening here that are completely out of your <laughs> control. But I have to say that whilst in England we didn't have an Eighth Amendment, I was brought up in a culture where the dominance was the obstetrician and I wouldn't have ever questioned a man in a white coat, ever. You know, it was my job to do what he told me to do. And I worked with a head of midwifery who was totally inspirational. She used to go home at night and vomit because she challenged the obstetricians so much. Um, things, simple things like um, not having a peephole in, in the door of the labour ward um, when they wanted them. And things like not having a cot card that was SMA and the doctors wanted them. You know, simple things. I remember getting into trouble because women wanted to have a bath after they'd had a baby. And what's wrong with that? When I, again, when I talk to student midwives, they say, what? And I say, yeah, and I t was told by my colleagues, if you do that again, if you let a woman have a bath, we're going to report you and you'll be struck off. So this is a, a woman having, having, having a normal birth, in an obstetric unit and I'd actually worked in the birth centre that was associated with this hospital so it was an affiliated unit where I'd had my children there and I'd had a bath and I'd help women to have baths but in this hospital that was the same organisation the midwife said you cannot do that because the women here are different. Why are they different? What's wrong with them? You know, they're no different, they're just having babies the same. But, it, you know, and obviously now women have baths. But So, what you know, again, it, things can move in directions that you can never imagine. But what it takes is something that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, which I know you have. So what's the impact of all this? Well, this was a student midwife who wrote this letter to say that she was at the end of her second year and she'd seen 52 cesarean sections and 16 instrumentals and only 11 normal deliveries. So what are we going to do about that? What's happening? You know, what, how, are we, uh, how on earth are we going to try to facilitate what Sue has been talking about if the student midwives aren't getting the right practice when they're training? We've got midwives telling us they're unhappy, like Sue said, and we've also got this, this issue where women, this is, this is in England, but so we've got, you know, lots of birth centres in England, midwife-led units. Women are being surveyed and being, they're telling us that they feel more positive about themselves, they feel more able to parent their baby and they feel um, happy after they've had their, more happy if they've had the baby in a midwife-led unit. And so what we've got is these polarisations of, of experience. So women in obstetric units aren't as happy. They're more likely to be depressed. They're more likely to be disconnected to their babies. And they're more likely to um, have other traumas like, like um, Sue has been talking about. So why don't we try to make the obstetric units like the birth centres? So as, as, as well as developing more birth centres to give women choice, why aren't we trying to change the obstetric units? so that everybody gets the same equal chance at having a positive experience. 
So what we're doing now is to keep alive, to keep, a, when I say alive, to keep on the surface of everything, we're tending to run around in vicious circles. We're just trying to cope with the situation and gather our attentions to what we can do to, you know, to survive the day and, and for women to, you know, get through, get, get, process women through, get the bed emptied, you know, and we're just going around in vicious circles and one thing leads to another. So the more intervention, the more fear, and it just goes around like that. So we have to try to break it. And how do we do it? So, you know, these are just some little solutions that, that I, 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 you know, both Sue and I, with working with various people around the world and look, reading the research and finding out what, you know, what others have done, we, we know that there are some things that we can do. Some things are out of our control at the moment. We can participate in trying to influence them. But in terms of self-preservation, the first thing we have to do is look after ourselves. We can't possibly give of ourselves if we don't look after ourselves. And, you know, there are lots of things out there. Um, if you go on to the, uh, this is a fabulous free resource at the moment. If you go on to the natal therapy um, website, Maggie Howells developed this um, uh, 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 hypnobirthing, because she calls it natal therapy. Uh, pr product, but she's giving away um, pr uh, resources to midwives at the moment. Uh, she wants you can download it direct to your iPhone or your, your mobile or whatever. Um, to, and it's about looking after yourself. That's just one thing. But there's loads of different websites. There's loads of Facebook pages where, and there's one Irish midwife, uh, uh, Janini, Janini, that set up Janie Webster, has set up a midwives for midwives, a Facebook page, which is closed, which is about supporting and nurturing each other, and it's brilliant. You know, it's I've seen lots of interactions going on on there, where midwives have looked at, are looking after the younger ones or you're looking after older ones, like me sometimes. Um, so compassion starts with yourself and we hear a lot about this now it's banded about you know particularly in england because there's this thing from the chief nurse that's called the six c's where one of the things is compassion so we have you know we're being told we have to be compassionate but what's it all about so first it has to start with ourselves and paul gilbert who's a, a an expert on you know he's kind of analyzed the research around compassion talks about it a lot and it's not about being soft and not always about kindness but it, it's sort of affiliated with, with, with courage. And certainly in my lifetime, in my career, you know, I've kind of had to marry the two up because I've sometimes asked myself, why did I do that? Why did I, why did I stick up for that woman? Why did I stick up for myself? Why did I stick up for that doctor? It was because I think inside my heart, there's this huge amount of compassion for that person. And that's what gave me the courage to do something. So when we become disenfranchised or when we become pressured and we tend to, you know, focus in because we're fearful and we, we, we lose our compassion because we're so focused on the task and we're so worried about getting into trouble that we have to kind of disassociate ourselves from what's going on. And do you remember when you saw the video of, of, of Uruguay where the midwives look really stern and really severe and, and they, they, they look like they, they didn't have an ounce of compassion in their bodies. And maybe they did have when they started. Maybe when they started in, but then the system broke them down. And ask yourself, you know, I, do you remember when you first saw a woman having a VE? When I first saw a woman having a VE, I was, I thought, oh my God, I feel a bit sick. This is awful. Because it wasn't done in a very compassionate way. And I, the thing that struck me was that I was in a room with others that weren't bothered about what was going on. And then the first time I saw legs in lithotomy and I saw a, um, a doctor trying to feel what he was feeling and he was getting carried away because, and then I saw my colleagues doing it and I was going, oh, and I thought I'm going to be sick. And then I thought, no, I have to do what they do. I have to watch what they do and I have to be like them because, because I have to cope with this job. But I think what happens is we become desensitized to those scenes. That scene that we saw in Uruguay, I haven't seen midwives being so horrible, but I've seen doctors leaning on women's legs as they've been chatting to each other. I've seen conversations going on with a woman's legs wide apart. And, you know, those are the things that we should be avoiding and we should be actually sticking up for our colleagues, sticking up for the women, most importantly, sticking up for the women, advocating for women. Is that right? We feel sick when we see it. Should we be saying, hold on a minute, this isn't right? Or should we be 
by standards and what standards at standards and watch it go on. You ask yourself about that. This is me actually. It's not me, but it's a photo. It kind of symbolises some of the times in my career because. What happens is student midwives or midwives say to me, oh, it's all right for you, Sheena, you know, it's all right for you because, you know, you've kind of got through it and you, you know, no, it's not all right for me, actually. I'm exactly like every single person in this room. I'm just a woman, a mum, a grandma, a daughter, and I was brought up in a council house. I didn't pass my 11 plus. I'm actually very ordinary. And anybody can do what I've done. I've not done anything extraordinary. All I've done is tried to stick close to my values of what I believe in, in terms of what I know that women really want and need. And there's times when I've been heartbroken, I've been devastated. Sue sat with me whilst I've cried for days on end because I went through a huge litigation process where my name was on the front page of the paper where I've lived for all my life saying that I damaged a baby. My children suffered from it because their friends at school criticised me and it was all wrong. It wasn't me. I hadn't done anything. And so I've been through all that. It's many years ago now. But what it didn't stop me from doing was being compassionate. It still, I still feel fearful from time to time. You know, I'm being intimidated at the moment on social media by a man who lost his child in the Morecambe Bay tragedy. And he completely hounds me to death and says awful things about me like I'm a bully and I'm not a bully and I have to be silent and I can't retaliate. So that I'm not, I'm just like you. That's what I'm trying to tell you is I'm no different. But the only thing I've done is con constantly kept women and their babies close to my heart and continued to carry on and make change happen. And during my time as a midwife, I've met the most amazing people that have actually encouraged me to. And this is one of them. She's called Tracy Cooper. And she's, got, she's a, a consultant midwife in England. She works in the north of England at the moment. She lives in Birmingham. And um, she's done the th things that I left my jaws dropping because she's tackled things like bullying when she went to the trust that she's in now. The head of midwifery was bullying all the staff. And they were coming to her and saying, you have to help us. And she had to tackle um, a, a big, massive issue of, of, a, of, of the head of midwifery bullying staff. Then she went into another organisation and helped them to deal with it. And Sue and I were saying, you know, she needs nurturing too. She needs looking after. So we look after her. We just try to look after each other because we're just human beings, but we're trying to do it together. So when we decided, we were sat in our garden when we decided to do this book and it was because of all these conversations and because we'd met lots of people and because I started to use Twitter and I found people like Robin Youngson who's a, um, an amazing anaesthetist in New Zealand who's left his job and is now working as a, an expert helping people to understand the importance of kindness. And, um, and he's written two chapters in our book. And so I, I, we had a chat about it and we said, let's try and do something. So that's why we, we wrote the book. We didn't write the book, we edited the book. And the book was really, wanted, we wanted it to be an inexpensive, not cheap, people get saying, don't say it's cheap, but inexpensive resource for midwives. And Sue's talked a little bit about it. But the, I want to tell you a little about Ollie. Ollie Armshaw, it was a student midwife in England. And um, Ollie, um, she went to, Brazil to do her elective placement. She's written the student midwives chapter in the book and she said what she knows she went to Brazil where they had in some parts of Brazil the cesarean section rates are 98% and um, she went to an area where they they specialized in making sure women were totally nurtured when they were having the babies and that was part of their process of humanization of childbirth so it wasn't about reducing the interventions as Sue's mentioned, it, what they did do that as well, but mainly they focused on giving extra care in terms of ca compassionate kindness and, and, and support. And it was that that, that really struck um, a home with Ollie, and she wrote about in the book because she said it was that that was, try was reducing the intervention rate because of, of the impact that it was having. And this is a, 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 a you know, I'd love somebody to tweet about this, Deirdre, um, because. <laughs> Can you see this photograph? This happened many years ago in the unit that I worked. And this is a mock-up, right? So, so this person here on the floor is an obstetrician. She's called Liz Martindale. She's on Twitter and she cringes 
when I tweet about her. And this is um, a, mid a midwife and a midwife and a porter that we dragged in. <laughs> and it's because um, what happened was we, we set up a, in, in our uh, maternity unit, uh, all the midwives were fearful about, about various things. And um, this, this woman had, had told us that she'd, ha when I was consultant midwife, she'd come to me and t told me that she'd had a really previous traumatic birth. And she was one of several that I saw, but she specifically said the thing that traumatised her most was having to get on the bed when she really didn't want to and having her legs in lithotomy. And she was c completely um, uh, uh, destroyed by the whole thing. So when she was having a second baby, she said she wanted, didn't want to get on the bed. There was absolutely no way she wanted to get on the bed. So she was referred to a caseloading group, a group practice that Sue and I actually developed because we worked together many years ago. And we developed this caseloading practice, so one-to-one -one group practice, you know, where, where midwives follow the woman through the whole continuum. And these midwives were, were working kind of on the edge all the time. So anything that, if women wanted care outside the guidelines, that's what they did. So this woman said, I, there's absolutely no way I want to get on the bed. I mean, there's two stories uh, that are related. But this one, this one um, when she got to uh, the stage where she was trying to, the same uh, period in her labour, that it, when things started to go wrong with her first one, she started to panic. Um, because she said, the baby's not coming, the baby's not coming. The baby wasn't coming, actually. The baby was, was, wasn't full arrested, but the baby was stuck, again, in exactly the same... Even though she'd walked around and done everything this time completely differently. But a part of it was because her body kind of seized up. So the, the midwife went out, and the midwife had built this really good relationship up with this, with this consultant. And she just said, you know, c can you come in? And the woman does not want to get, off the bed, get on the bed. So what Liz did is she said to the woman, don't worry, I'm just going to help feel, it, feel where your baby is and I'm just going to assess the situation. Did that. Then she said, I'm going to put some forceps on your baby's head, which is what the woman had last time. And I'm not going to, you, know, you don't have to get on the bed. You can do it when you stood up. And I'm just going to take the baby down a little bit, take the forceps off and you can push your baby out yourself. And that's what she did. And the woman was so overcome by it. She actually wrote a story and she wrote a book, she wrote like a, a whole book to give to the, the obstetrician to tell her how it had completely reformed her childbirth experience. And then another woman shortly after, the same group of midwives, um, she was actually on the bed but it was bringing it all back from what happened before. And, and Mrs Martindale, Liz Martindale actually got her off the bed and did a von Tuss and, and, and again pulled it off and the midwife caught the baby. So she just took, pulled the Vontus, got the baby down, took the Vontus off, and she did it with my daughter as well. And she's done it with lots of mi women. And actually, I tweeted her today to say, I'm going to be talking about you tonight. And she asked, like, oh, God. And then she, and then she said, um, I've, I've, done it, I've been doing it again. But what she says is she doesn't do it a lot because women aren't off the bed. So she said, women, most women are on the bed, so that's why I don't do it a lot. But one of the things that... Oh, I'll come on to that afterwards. But the thing is, the respect... The mutual respect is massive. And she loved it when we said to her, oh, my God, Liz, this is amazing. And she kept, you know, she kind of says, oh, yeah, you know. Uh, but she really does love us, encouraging her. And she loves it now. I don't work there anymore. But I'm always talking, and Sue talks about her as much as I do. Um, so can you hear a roar? Well, I can hear a roar. I know that things aren't perfect. But there's so many reasons why we can hear a roar. You've got your strategy. I mean, I, we read it this morning, Sue and I, and my, my heart was jumping with joy with so many parts of it. I mean, you still use the word risk a lot, but hey, it's a start, you know? Um, and, and it doesn't have to be the next time you won't have risk in there. You know, just keep, see it as a, yeah, see it as a, a massive step forward. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant that you've got it. And there might be loads of things wrong with it, but look for the positives. Look for the fantastic things in it. Are you Irish? I am Irish. Well, you do it then. You change it. <laughs> yeah. So, because I used to get a bit fed up when midwives in my unit used to say, "Yeah, but they say this," and I say, "No, you're they. Yeah, you're th you're this. You're the raw. Not they're not the raw. God help us." Um, so let's think about each other, you know. One of the things that really worked in my organisation, it cost nothing and it absolutely shifted things no end, was telling each other 
good things, right? So you see something brilliant. You know, you know, I bet when you go on a shift, you know who the good ones are. And you love it when you go on a shift and you think, oh, she's on. It's going to be a great shift, don't you? Every single midwife thinks that around the world. You go, oh, yeah, I want to be on with her. I like being on with her. So those good ones, how many times do you tell them how brilliant they are? But I don't just mean saying you're fantastic, you. I mean saying, do you know why you're good? Is because you do this and you do this and you do this. But don't tell them in the cubby hole or in the labour ward when nobody's there. Tell them in front of everybody. And you're going to find it hard at first, but practice it. Practice between, because at first you'll, you, they'll go like this. And the person you're telling will get all worked up. But you know, I've got some fabulous stories and I'm going to tell you one really quickly. When, when my mum had a stroke and she was really sick, she, she, was, she didn't speak for 27 years. You know, she was, she was, she was, it was awful. And so me and, and I've got the five girls and me and my sisters, every time she was admitted to hospital, we were always there protecting her because she couldn't speak. Right. So the only time that she was admitted that a doctor actually gave her proper patient centered care was one, you know, I can't describe the interaction, but it was amazing. It was a woman doctor, she came in and she was, she didn't talk to her like she was stupid, she didn't shout. She actually asked my mum if it was okay if she talked to us rather than just talking to us and ignoring her because mum couldn't speak. But she could hear very well and her brain was brilliant and she had beautiful eyes. But, um, but she, she so, so I followed her out after this consultation. I said, excuse me, can I have a word with you? She said, yeah, it was in the emergency department. And I, because she used to fall a lot, my mum, so it was after a fall. So I said... Um, can I just tell you that um, what you did in there to my mum was one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. My mum has been, she has, she's been disabled for 20 odd years and I have never seen such a brilliant reaction. She went like this. <laughs> she went like this and she cl clutched her, her neck and she went all red and then she burst into tears. And I said, honestly, I could cry now. And I said, oh my God, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. And she said, Nobody has ever said that to me before. She said, you know, you're the first person that's ever said anything like that to me. And she said, I've had a terrible day. She said, I got up this morning, I fell out with my husband, my children were naughty, I nearly crashed the car. I couldn't get a car parking space. The bastard who's in charge today has rollicked me. And she's, I tad a bit every time I tell this story. But she, <laughs> but she soon knows that. But seriously, the, the thing that struck me was that, you know, she, why is that? Why is that? that? I'm the first person to tell her how brilliant. She was an exemplary doctor. You know, why is she not being told? So let's start telling each other. And what happened in, in our trust, in our little, you might not be able to change the whole hospital, but you can change the little area that you work in because people respond to it. We're human beings. You know, we respond to cuddles, we respond to affection, we respond to being told how lovely we are. I've, when I came to Ireland this morning, I have never had such lovely people talking to me. They're going, hiya, Sheena, are you all right? You know, like, we don't say in the Lancashire accent. <laughs> but, you know, but this kind of like, you know, engaging with me straight away and making me feel really special. And what happens is I go, hi, right back, you know, because it, it, it matters. And so it's not about being all like American and, you know, you're fantastic and have a nice day. It's about authentic real feedback and boosting up those people that are doing great things. Think about your language. We've talked about it tonight. You know, um, there's so much in how we say things. You know, let's not talk about she's, she's refused something. She's declined it because it's not imperative that she has it. So, you know, we have to think about the words that we use. I've, you can have this. This slide is tweeted all around the world, actually. Um, it's, being used, it's being used widely. Um, we've got, nice, I know you've got different guidelines, but use these because I'm not saying they're better and I'm not saying all nice guidelines are good. Please don't think I, I'm saying that. But, you know, the intrapartum nice guidelines that uh, are now, you know, several years old, use them because in it will, they will help you. Use them as tools. This is the middle for unit network that was mentioned in my introduction. And this is because when I was developing birth centres, um, we didn't, I didn't have a resource and we've now got, this is a website, we've got this resource 
and Dublin has been, Ireland has been invited to join the European network that is led by Lucia Rocca and uh, Felipe Castro and Sue Down and Chris McCourt. They're doing lots of work with European countries in helping them to develop more birth centres, more midwife led units and join you all up together. And I know that um, there are a couple of, of, of midwives in the room that are going to be joining that. But anybody can join. It's not exclusive. And it's, on here will be loads of resources for hospitals to set up midwife-led units. Um, I'm really excited about it because we've done it voluntary, um, but now the Royal College of Midwives is funding us to do it um, properly, which is great. You've got the Lancet, which we've heard about. The Lancet is the most important document that I've had in my career. Um, and I, I can't tell you enough how, I mean, if you can't read the whole thing, read the exec executive summary and have this laminated in your pocket because the definition of midwifery here is revelation. It's a revelation. If you're setting up midwifery-led services, use this because it's just, you know, the best thing that's ever been written about midwifery. Um, we've got, you've got this wonderful midwife who I think is in the room challenging systems, pushing things forward. How amazing that you've got Philomena Canning. You know, we all have somebody like Philomena in our countries and I just think, you know, God bless midwives like this that stick up for what they believe in. You've got, um, you've got AIMS, you know, if I didn't have AIMS in England and the Association of Radical Midwives, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. You know, they give you backbone, they give you support, they give you the power to your elbow because things have to change. We can't keep doing things the way we're doing now. There is a film and I'm going to show it you at the end. I've actually linked it in, but I'll show it you at the end because I want to show you something else first. Why am I not getting it? Yeah, I'll show it you at the end if that's all right. We've got social media and, and you know, I've seen the back, bad side of it, but the bad side is very minimal. It can be quite damaging, but it's minimal. The main thing is it is one of the most positive things that can happen. And when I left the NHS, I was feeling a bit kind of stuck and, and not in contact with anybody. And then I found Twitter. And uh, I mean, using Facebook all the time for my family stuff. But Twitter, I thought, oh my God, I'm meeting all these people from all around the world and they're all midwives. And what you tend to do with Twitter is you tend to link with the same kind of people. Mm -hmm. So you're you become affiliated to them. And then when you meet them in real life, it's really funny. I was just at the airport and I got my bag search. You know, like when you get your bag search mm -hmm. and this really funny man was saying, You've got this cream in your bag. You've got this cream. In your bag. I'm going, oh, I'm so sorry. And it's called Tom or Don or something. And I kept saying, what's your name? You're so nice. Because he kept putting them in a plastic bag. He didn't confiscate them. Yeah. And then I just stood back like this. And a woman stood next to me. And she said, um, and, she's, and she was speak, speaking with an Irish, uh, an um, uh, American accent. So I said, which part of America are you from? Because I talked to everybody. And she told me. And I said, I said, um, I said, uh, oh, my sister lives in America, blah, blah, blah. And then she said, she told me she was going back because mum was really sick, so she was sad. So I said, um, she said, what are you going to, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Dublin. Oh, are you going to Dublin on holiday? I said, no, I'm going to speak at an event. And she said, what about? I said, midwifery. And she went, oh! She said, I'm a doula. Are you Sheena Byram? Oh, I know you. She said, I know you from Twitter. She said, I know I've seen you on Twitter. And I said, oh, my God. So we immediately hugged. And then she's been tweeting me all the time and telling me how her mum is. So how cool is that? Um, so, uh, but the, th the good thing, I'm going to give you one example of why it's amazing. You have got a midwife in, a, in Ireland who is called Deirdre, and she sat over there, and she's going to kill me. But she, she wait a minute, what's happening? It's, got, it's frozen because it's gone on you, Deirdre. Um, so Deirdre Munro here, here you see, there she is speaking at the World Health Innovation Summit in England, right, the people from all over the world came to this event and she was a guest speaker and she was talking about the power of social media and the, the, her speech is online and if you get a chance to hear it, we can put a link on Twitter afterwards, listen to what she's telling you because it's so fabulous, she's got the resources and the, the, the know-how, how to connect people right across the world, she's set up this thing called Global Village Midwives, yeah, clap. She's absolutely dynamic. We met, I met, I met uh, Deirdre in a field in Prague and, and we ended up finding out we were staying in the same hotel and she looked after me. Her and her friend Naomi looked after me um, and for ages they took me to a, a restaurant and everything. We nearly got molested, didn't we? 
And, um, and that's how we met. But since then, she's become kind of like this world-renowned person. She's actually from your country. How proud you must be to have Deirdre Munro in your country, because I'm proud to be her friend, because she's doing amazing things. And you'll have to ask her afterwards what she's doing. We've got human rights approach. And again, I know that you've got the Eighth Amendment. But you still, we still have to consider um, how we work with that. And I think you should ask Sue Down about the Eighth Amendment, actually, because she's got some little tips for you. Um, use it. And just, to, I'm not going to go on about it again, but I just want to play this little clip, what this midwife said. Yes. So I've read Roe Behind the Silence. And it was From really Wales. Inspirational. And it really was good to see on paper the things I thought and I feel very passionate about. And I have another five, six years of midwifery, and I intend to use the stuff in that book to further the work we're doing in Cumtaf. Thank you. In Cumtaf. Isn't that a lovely word? <laughs> so, um... So, yeah, so the people are using it. So be the change, right? Be the change. However you want to do it, be the change. This is a, this is a, a conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. He's called Ben Zander. He's written a book called The Art of Possibility, and some of it's a bit Americanized, but some of it's really good because he talks about perspective and how we see th things through certain perspectives, and, and we sometimes see the negatives rather than the positives. So he talks about this, this, this guy who goes to India and he's setting up a shoe factory in the 1970s. So he sends out two market researchers, and it's before the time of, of computers, and it was fax time. Do you remember when we had fax? Mm -hmm. Say faxing. And, um, and he, he had two people faxing him back. So one of the market research researchers said from this village in India, it's no good here, sir. Nobody wears shoes. No good. Don't no point setting one up here. And the other one said, brilliant opportunity here. Nobody has any shoes. <laughs> so exactly the same situation. So when you think of yourself as Ireland, don't think, oh, yeah, but we've got this. Think, yeah, we've got these fantastic things, like you brilliant midwives and service user representatives and groups like Ames and all the rest of you. So think about the positives and use them. You know, d get out of your comfort zone. Today I was in a meeting where a midwife who's in the room tonight actually spoke out and talked about how she developed a service and how she'd really like others to ask her how to do it because she knows how to do it and we should be using her resource, you know, and to actually do that in a meeting. To see she's stepping outside a comfort zone. Good on you. Do it. And if you think you're too small to make a difference, there'd be student midwives in the room. You know, you might think, oh, I can't do that. I'm too, you know, don't think like that. There are student midwives making massive changes. Leaders are everywhere. Leaders are making changes that, you know, just within your grasp. Be a standout. You know, speak up for what you believe in. It's okay if you're a standout. There will be people trying to chop your head off. You know, there's, there's this phenomenon of chopping the heads off tall poppies. It happens all the time. But you have to speak up and be counted. Illuminate your talents. Be bold enough to use your voice, brave enough to listen to your heart, and strong enough to live the life you've always imagined. And this is, this is Sue Down's slide. Um, and it's about counterbalancing the fear with love. So the more we can love ourselves, and the more we can love each other, and the more we can love the women that we care for, the more likely we are to, ca to counteract fear. And this isn't about being in love, it's about carous love, it's about caring and being affectionate and, and being kind to each other. Because it does, it is an antidote to, to being scared. You'll start to find yourself changing when you, when you love more. And good things do happen, they really do. Mm -hmm. and, and these are from England, I know, but and I haven't got time to, to, to research um, things in Ireland, but I've talked about a few already. But, you know, this is a student midwife who decided that she saw the evidence around optimal core clamping. So she didn't only just reproduce her work, she went to a company and asked them to fund it so that any maternity unit can have these posters. You just need to tweet her, email her, go on her website and ask for some and she'll send them to you free of charge for your maternity units about optimal core clamping. So I'm just showing you as examples. We've got midwives who are using horrendous rooms that look like operating theatres, trying to make them better. Even if the maternity service doesn't let them do that, they're doing it, they're working with it because they want to shift things. So we've got to applaud all that. 
you know, Jenny the M, this is a midwife who I met on Twitter, who's worked with another midwife that she met on Twitter to develop a skin to skin. She's passionate about skin to skin. Again, you can get these free, you can download them, um, an infographic around that. Um, and I just want to show this film. I'm going to finish it there. I'm going to finish it because I, what you can do is, if you Google hashtag birth just happened, you can, you can watch it yourself. And that's the power of social media because what happened was the positive birth movement. Have you heard of the positive birth movement? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh you're going to get a little bit here. We are. We are. <laughs> We're such a great, <laughs> such a great crew. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. Happy, well, happy, happy, happy. happy, happy. 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 <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> have you heard of the positive birth movement? Yeah, they're, they're around in Ireland. Well, the Millie Hillu set it, set it up. It's a free resource that you can set up your own groups. And what they did is they asked people to use the hashtag uh, birth just happened, and then they collated them all from all the tweets. So it's a great thing, you know, social media. And, and when we hear so many negative stories, it's great to show something so positive like that. So let's turn the vicious circles into virtuous cycles or circles by doing those things, by loving, by trying to care for each other and ourselves more, and by, um, by nurturing. You know, human relationships are the things that really count. Um, so just quickly, just um, this is my hand here, my old wrinkled hand, and my, my granddaughter, my youngest Aww. granddaughter, Myla. And I, I use this photograph because when, when she, was, she was, my daughter was really sick, she had preeclampsia, she needed a cesarean, um, her, her blood pressure was so high, she, they were worried that she'd have a stroke. And she was born, Myla was born early, she's two and a half now. And, um, and, when, and when, I, when I saw her, so tiny, and I just thought, when she has a baby, I just hope that she's not put in stirrups, and I hope that she has kind and compassionate care, and I hope that the midwife who looks after her, or the doula, loves her. I want her to love her. I don't want her to be disconnected. I just hope that I won't be here, I'll be dead, but I want somebody to love her. So, I know I will. So if I go on at this rate, I will. 
So, um, so just smile, be the best you can, find a positive role model, because positive role models have helped me get through, by God, have they, in my life. And the six C's I'm going to miss out, because you don't have those in, in Ireland, but it's, look, look it up if you want to look it up. Love your job. Even when it's hard, try to love it as much as you can. Help others to grow. You get so much from helping others to grow. Be kind to yourself and join Twitter. <laughs> and fantastic um, presentations from both Sue and Sheena. Unbelievable. We're, we're so inspired this evening. It's a really special evening. Um, a big round of applause. Oh.